everyone, it's DJ here. Let's start off with a little easier topic this week. But before I get into that, I'd like to make a quick announcement. I made this announcement a few days ago with my uh, little bonus episode about the Senator's comments on reservists, but it's always worth saying again. I've installed a new capability on the website called SpeakPipe. This is a widget, a capability which will allow you to make up to a three minute uh, voice recording and send it to me. So this is another way that you can send me questions, comments, anything that you would like. And you just might hear yourself being played on a future episode with my commentary and, um, and answers. So I ask that you uh, take a look at that, make use of it. As of this moment, the website is still loading quite slowly, so please be patient with it and uh, give it a chance to load completely. I am still having the site uh, revamped, so eventually it will be a much faster, much easier to use product for you. But at the moment, it's still a bit slow. All right, so this week is going to be an unscripted episode. I decided I would just go off of a guide that I made for you as a script rather than writing an actual article. I will write the article and post that uh, this Friday, just like always. But as far as this recording, I'm going to go freeform. So this week's topic is, what is the gray area? You've heard me say in the past, a gray area retiree, a reserve retiree, re retiree awaiting pay, things like that. Well, this week I'm going to explain just what that is. Now, for an active duty retiree, someone with you know, the required amount of service, when they retire, they get retired pay and all the benefits that go with retirement right away. We reservists are on a slightly different plan. When we retire, if we are under age 60, we go into what is called the gray area. The official term is being put in the retired reserve, but well, that's a lot of syllables, so we say gray area. The reason we say that is it is kind of a gray area. You're retired, but you're not. In, in a really official technical category, all that has happened is you've been transferred into another component, in the Army Reserve, they call it a control group. You're in a different status, but you're still in the military, not fully retired. It, the retired reserve is essentially a holding cell, a waiting room, you know, waiting for you to reach the age at which you can receive your pension. But that is not without benefit. There are several benefits to being in the retired reserve. One of them is since you still have a military status, then you are still accruing longevity of service. And anyone familiar with the military pay scale knows that the longer you're in service, the more money you make, up to a certain point per pay grade, of course. The higher you are, the farther along that scale goes uh, and increases as your length of service increases. So when you are in the retired reserve, you still gain longevity for pay purposes. You also still maintain the cost of living increases that go along with still being in the military. If you had discharged completely, you would not get those cost of living increases. Your pay would be based on the pay scale in effect when you separated. So those two little things are actually quite big when it comes to the money that goes in your pocket once you hit the right age. But what about other benefits? There are things besides just the cash that make being a military retiree so unique. Well, let me go through a quick list of what some of those are. And for those interested, you can find in the show notes a chart that I've made. I actually borrowed it 
you know, word for word and just reformatted it from the Human Resources Command website. Just for full disclosure, I didn't write this myself, but there are some you know, provisos, some slight changes I'll make verbally as we go along because this isn't entirely accurate. It technically is but there are a few exceptions to some of the things here. So let's just go along some, on some of these, hit some of the major topics, and see what we can make of it. Obviously, we can't have a discussion, which I'd love to have on this. If this were a formal presentation to a group, it would be quite interesting because you'd get the back and forth feedback. And that's always interesting, illuminating, and useful. But since it's just me and a microphone and a camera, we'll make do with what we have, and hopefully your commentary in the episode comments can be some good feedback for the rest of the audience. So let's take a look. The first and most obvious sign of being a gray area retiree is your military ID card. You no longer have a Common Access Card, or CAC. You have a Teslin, or paper-based uh, and laminated card, for people in the gray area. That card is pink in color, although some call it red. You know, it's pinkish. If you've watched red versus blue, light red you know, it might be another term you'd use, but there's a word for light red, pink. All right, so actual gray area retirees have a pink card, and there is a separate card for their dependents, spouses and children. And, uh, and right off the top of my head, that color does not come to mind. I believe it's tan. All right, so that is the most obvious sign of being a gray area retiree, and actually it's the key to everything else. So if you do not have a retired reserve ID card, then you please go and get one. In fact, I'll post in the show notes a link to a, what's the word I want, a, a site locator for Deer's ID card sites. If you don't have an ID card, make use of this and find the closest ID card facility to you. Well, in fact, in the future, I will do an episode on the types of ID cards and how you can get the proper one for yourself, as well as the documents you would need to do so. All right. Now, before I go into the rest, let me talk about the other type of ID card. Once you actually hit age 60, once you actually start receiving your retired pay, you actually are eligible for a different type of ID card. This one is blue and has a few key differences over the pink card. The most important one is on the back, there's a section that says medical with two subclauses. The first says direct which means on post medical care, and the other says civilian, which means, of course, from civilian providers who accept TRICARE. Both of those will say yes on them. This means you are TRICARE eligible, and your blue ID card is actually your TRICARE health insurance card as well. Your dependents will also have new cards with the same statement on the back. This is the primary difference other than color from the retired reserve card. For retired reserve ID cards, for TRICARE eligibility, it says no. All right, so like I said, the ID card is the key to unlock all of the other benefits I'm going to describe. So let's go through a few of those. Obviously, the most important for people who have military installations in their state is access to those installations. There are a lot of facilities and benefits that can be 
utilized if you can just get on post. And your ID card is the way to get on post. That proves that you are eligible to make use of everything there. And if you are not in uniform, which you wouldn't be if you're retired, then obviously when you are in these facilities and trying to make use of them, you'll be asked to show your ID card again. This is most common and most easily understood by those of us who make use of commissaries and post exchanges. If you're in civilian clothes, they ask to see your ID card. And after that, it's just another transaction. You're good to go. So we have military installations and all of those goodies. That's the most obvious benefit for post access. But there's a lot more than simply the, the PX or BX if you're Air Force and the commissaries. There's also theaters, shopettes, recreational facilities, bowling alleys, libraries, other little stores, things of that nature. All of these are going to want to see your ID card before you come inside or when you're actually making a purchase. You're going to need to present those those cards in order to prove you're eligible to make use of those facilities. Very easy. Now let's get into some other things. I mentioned medical facilities. Well, if you are a reserve retiree, then in most cases you are not able to use the medical facilities unless you've been uh, subject to a retiree recall and put on an active duty status, then during the time you're in that status, you yourself would have access to medical facilities, but your spouses and dependents would not. That obviously would change once you are age 60 and TRICARE eligible again, then you can all make use of medical facilities. Now, let me mention one thing with uh, this chart that I'm going to post. The next thing on this list is TRICARE. And the chart says not eligible for gray area retirees. There is a version of TRICARE called TRICARE Retired Reserve, which is eligible, which is available for purchase. It is quite expensive. The reason for this is simply that TRICARE itself is a heavily subsidized benefit for those of us who have to pay for it. But the TRICARE Retired Reserve version is not subsidized, so you pay the full price of that benefit. For a single member, the TRICARE Retired Reserve rate is a little over $400 per month. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I have talked about them in the past. Uh, for a family, the monthly rate is a little over $1,000 per month. Those premiums are only in effect while you're in the gray area. Once you hit age 60, there are no premiums unless you choose a different version of TRICARE, which is premium-based. So that is available. Some people choose to use it. Some choose to go with health care from other sources, health insurance from other sources, I should say. That's your prerogative. That's your choice. Another thing available to reservists in the gray area, believe it or not, is the TRICARE Retiree Dental Program. You are eligible to purchase that. Those premiums are different based on your location, so I'm not going to give any examples of it right now. If you'd like information on that, just go to trdp.org. That's Tango Romeo Delta Papa dot org. And you can find the premiums for your area. That's also available for purchase when you are receiving the retired pay. Um, also, please remember when I, based on my episode of TRICARE updates for 2018, that next year, the TRDP is going away. So TRICARE Retiree Dental Program will not exist in 2019. What will replace it is the Federal Employee Dental and Vision Insurance Program, or FedBIP. That will be something in which you can start enrolling in November of this year 
and make use of it uh, starting in 2019. And again, uh, your status in the DEERS database, the ID card database, needs to be updated to reflect your eligibility for either TRICARE or the Duncan program. So let's move on to some other goodies. One of the biggest benefits that I have pointed out to people when they are going into the retired reserve and when they are signing up for their retired pay, excuse me, is the use of military lodging facilities. This is a huge savings to the wallet when you are traveling across the country. I've had to go to various places in my career and have chosen many times rather than, obviously I was allowed to stay off post if I wanted, but I chose to stay on post because of the significant cost difference. In fact, on several occasions just in my area, I was put on temporary travel orders and the cost to stay in a hotel on the economy was about $120 per month, but I was able to stay in a room on post for about $24. Oh wait, that's not $120 per month, per night. And I was able to stay on post for $24 per night and sometimes less, it just depends on the type of room I get. So that in itself is a, an enormous saving and you can use that while you're serving, when you're in the retired reserve, and when you're receiving retired pay. Again, all you have to do is show your ID card and you're good to go. A little utilized benefit, uh, one that requires a great deal of flexibility is space A travel. Space A means space available. This means that you could, if there is space on that flight, you could hop on to any military flight going in almost any destination, to almost any destination, and uh, either have a quick vacation or sightsee or it might even be business related. But if it's business related, obviously you will probably go for something with a little more definite of a timetable. With Space A, it's exactly what it says. If there's space available and if they're accepting passengers. So if you're going to use this, the recommendation is, of course, have a very flexible time frame, like several days on either side of your trip just for those times when there might not be space available or flight times change, etc. And here's another interesting little thing. You may have heard of Sato or Carlson Wagon Lit. This is a military contracted travel agency and they can help you set up trips as well. This, if that's available on your post, actually you can use it just about anywhere. And again, you just need your ID card. You can use them to book travel, book hotels, flights, rental cars, all of that. Just have to give them a call. And rather than give you know, all kinds of conflicting information, I would say just hop on your browser of choice and search for Carlson Wagon Lit. And you can find the proper spelling of that on the chart that I'll post in the show notes. Now, we're getting into some deep stuff here, some of the more morbid things that people don't like to think about, but we need to keep in mind. Survivor assistance, casualty assistance, things of that nature. And that's actually where people like me come in. For survivor assistance, if the person was gray area or a retiree receiving pay, then the assistance from survivor benefit counselors and employees of survivor outreach services are available to you. All you have to do is ask. In fact, specifically with the survivor outreach services people, they are not allowed to reach out and make contact with survivors. They have to be contacted first. But that is where people like me, a retirement services officer, can bridge the gap. I can actually reach out to 
survivors and offer services as they're available. And more often than not, those services are happily accepted. Family services, here we'll get into a happier note. There are a great many programs out there for families and children that fall under the family services umbrella. This could be anywhere from child and youth development programs, leadership camps, all kinds of fun activities for children. There's a wide array of programs out there. I used to work in the family program section in, in my area, and there was a great deal available to the families. Um, not just fun stuff, but also you know, emergency assistance. So if we had a, a veterans assistance program, so if you had a short-term emergency, we could find ways to step in and assist. Um, resume services, survivor outreach actually fell under family programs in my area. Um, so did the uh, personal financial counselors that I've described in the past. Strangely enough, funeral honors program fell under family programs. That was odd. But uh, that's just some of the services available from family programs. So if you search for military family programs online, you'll find a, a long list of very interesting little tidbits that are available to you. And now we go back to the darker topics, you know, life insurance. You are not eligible for servicemen's group life insurance after you leave service. You've got to be in an actively drilling or actively serving status in order to have SGLI. So that includes uh, people in the individual ready reserve, by the way. You are not considered to be in the ready reserve, an actively drilling status. So you are not eligible for SGLI when you're in that status. You have to come out, perform military duty, pay the premiums, and if you choose, go back into an IRR status, but that coverage will maintain for at least the month for which you pay the premium. So if you're coming in and out every month, you still have coverage the whole time. When you leave service, Within 120 days, at least, uh, your SGLI coverage will lapse. And if you choose, you can convert that, pre that, that coverage to a veterans group life insurance policy. Personal opinion here, warning, warning. Um, I would not recommend going with veterans group life insurance or VGLI. And that's for one simple reason. It is extremely expensive. If you choose the maximum, $400,000 in coverage, then every five years, effectively, the premium doubles. Let's go all the way to the extreme. If you are 75 years old, the monthly premium for VGLI is $1,840 per month. And you can certainly find better rates elsewhere. And for the younger crowd, it is you know, slightly better than $1,800, but it very quickly becomes excessive. So you can easily find other insurance out there at a much better rate. The last one that I'm going to cover in detail is, well, not even really in detail, is Veterans Administration benefits. Reservists are a funny crowd as far as the VA is concerned. They are, in their mindset, active duty centric. So they're used to dealing with people who are active duty. They're not used to reservists, even though we actually outnumber the active duty folks. But some reservists are eligible for VA benefits compensation for disabilities, some medical care on a limited basis, home loans, educational assistance, things of that nature. Reservists do have limited VA benefits, but it varies widely from individual to individual. 
it's completely based on your type of service. So if you were just a, a drilling National Guardsman your whole career, then you would have some educational assistance, you know, a GI Bill of some sort. You'd be eligible for a home loan. And if you are retirement eligible, then you could be eligible for things like a VA paid marker for a grave site. If you have had active duty experience, particularly if it's um, deployments, mobilizations, or active duty over 180 days and not for training purposes, then you could have a much wider set of VA benefits. But again, it varies wildly from person to person, so it would be best to contact a VA rep or a veteran services officer. Actually, that's who I'd recommend more so. The veteran services officer in your area, and they can explain what's available to you. All right, this last item I'm going to hit just you know, in kind of a glossing over manner. Uh, state benefits. Uh, every state has its own set of service member benefits of one type or another. In fact, what I'd like to know from you, the audience, is would you like, maybe not a series, because if I did that, it'd be a state per week or, or, or more often for a long time, and it can be rather repetitive. But would you be interested in episodes that pick in a certain state and describe all of the service member benefits for that state? Would that be of interest and of use to you? In fact, I will uh, post a poll on this episode for those watching on YouTube anyway, and you can give me some feedback there. For those on podcast, please send me an email at dj at rcretirement.com and let me know your thoughts on that question in that manner. All right. So like I said, I did not go over everything on this chart. You can find it by looking in the show notes. There's a great deal I didn't cover, and I think you'll be surprised when you take a look at what's here. And this is just what's posted officially. There's a lot more out there. For example, during Veterans Day and Memorial Day, a lot of civilian companies offer discounts to service members and to veterans. And very often they want to see an ID card and and or, normally or, a DD-214 or NGB-22. I would recommend, of course, the ID card. It's a lot easier to carry around. And it doesn't have uh, personal information splattered all over it as well. In fact, uh, let me throw that out there real quick. If you have an ID card that has your Social Security number on it or the Social Security number of your sponsor on it, use the site locator I'm going to put in the show notes make an appointment with an ID card facility and get a new card. The new cards have a Department of Defense ID number on them instead of a Social Security number. So if it gets lost or if a copy is made, then you don't have as much of your personal information floating around out there as a temptation to identity thieves. So please, if you have a card with an SSN on it, go get a new card. All right, so I believe that's quite enough for this week. We're already past the 29-minute mark. This is actually a lot longer than I thought it would be, but I kind of got in the groove there, so it was enjoyable. All right, so as always, if you have questions or comments, please post them in the comments section of this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the like button and subscribe. So I have a, a good indication of how many people are actually paying attention out there. That's always cool. If you think this information is useful and would benefit other people, please hit share and send this to them so those people can make use of this information as well. I always enjoy 
comments from you. I've had several just today, in fact, and that was a nice experience in itself. So thank you for being part of this audience. Thank you for your activity. Thank you for your continued interest. And, of course, thank you for your service. Have a great day. If you liked what you heard on today's episode, then please go below and give it a thumbs up, and be sure to subscribe to this channel. Also, please let other people know about this channel and the information it can provide for them. If you have questions or comments, then have no qualms about posting them in the comments section below. Please remember the RC Retirement YouTube channel and the RC Retirement website are not recognized or endorsed by the Department of Defense, the Department of Veterans Affairs, or any other government agency. The information presented in these resources are for entertainment and informational purposes only. Also, the content of either of these resources should not be considered financial or legal advice. Please consult with your own legal counsel, accountant, and financial planner before making any decisions based on what you have learned here. As always, thank you for watching the RC Retirement YouTube channel.